M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hello and welcome to episode 169 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Strzok. And after over seven years, jury selection has begun in the 2016 Trump election interference trial. We'll go over day one of the trial along with the Senate judiciary finally, finally starting to issue some subpoenas. Yes, and we'll also have some updates from Fulton County and the latest in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case, including an investigation into Weisselberg's perjury, for which he is sitting in Rikers for five months. But first, we have some patrons to thank. And thank you so much to our patrons. We could not do this show without you. Linda Hartman, Leslie Bennett, Brad Snyder, Denise Herity, uh, let's see, Kayvan, Amy Rebecca, Joaquin Romero, Judith Strunk, Sarah, and Punspector. Thank you so much to all of you for supporting independent media and for supporting this show. We couldn't, like I said, do it without you. So we appreciate you very much. All right. We're going to start in New York um, with <laughs> with the criminal trial finally underway. Man, how long have we been covering this? <laughs> <laughs> so long. So yeah. long. Yeah. Seven years. I mean, for you, you were, you were covering it when I was still working. You were covering it with the yeah. uh, Mueller She Wrote stuff back as it all started unfolding in the uh, 2017 time frame. Yeah, before our friendship was even a gleam in my eye, sir. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was I was looking at this stuff uh, way back in the Mueller investigation. And first, I just want to kind of set the scene. Law enforcement had released statements last week saying they're ready. They're ready to go. Uh, the NYPD said planning for high profile security events is very familiar ground for the New York City Police Department. Uh, the court security said, in coordination with the Secret Service and the NYPD, we stand ready and able to protect the safety of everyone in the courthouse during this trial, maintaining a secure and safe courtroom environment in facilitating the needs of the court, the trial participants, the media, and the general public. And the Secret Service said that we are prepared to effectively carry out our protective mission here in New York. That's Patrick J. Freeney, special agent in charge at the U.S. Secret Service New York field office. In a statement, he went on to say, while operational security precludes us from going into specifics, the Secret Service will not seek any special accommodations outside of what would be required to ensure the continued safety of the former president. All of this for the about 40 or 50 Trump supporters that showed up uh, at the courthouse today of the uh, of the couple million Trump voters that live within an hour of the courthouse. Right. About 50, 40 or 50 showed up. Um, it was uh, pretty quiet at the courthouse today. So, you know, Donald Trump putting out on Truth Social, it was going to be pandemonium and wild millions of supporters would be there uh, to to back him up. Um, it didn't really materialize today. And I think that that's pretty important to note. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a combination of things. I mean, I think New York City by its nature, spectacle sort of uh, is is at a different level. And I think what it takes to get people out is maybe a little different in New York City than probably any other, frankly, any other city in the world. So I think between a certain level of whether it's uh, <laughs> not not caring enough to go downtown, whether it's simply the sort of commitment of time and energy to show up to you know, to protest or demonstrate, it's it's easier to drive drive your MAGA truck to the exit of Mar-a-Lago than it is to to you know kind of go into downtown at New York City. So, I, again, I'm not 
I think and hope and pray that it will be a safe trial. I don't have the same happy, warm feelings down in Fulton County that I do in New York City for a number of reasons, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But it's, it's you know, it, what, it, what I don't like, what I don't like is turning on after trial is done and seeing CNN with a goddamn O.J. Simpson white Ford Bronco style camera footage chasing Trump to wherever he's going. We don't need that. We don't need that. He doesn't deserve it. Don't, you know, I know you got to put something on the screen, but frankly, show me your talking heads. I don't need to see Trump's motorcade driving through New York. Again, by the way, all of that Secret Service detail that you see in front and behind him, that Secret Service officer that you hear giving that statement and all the things they're doing, all of that being done on your taxpayer dollar. Because this man, time and time again, 81 times, accused of violating the law that we're now having to pay for that Secret Service and police and court security and NYPD and everybody else who has to provide security because this fucking asshole couldn't just <laughs> obey the law. Oh, we're getting some... Sorry, uh, I, I, the, I... Yeah, for your... swearing, swearing jacket's coming through. Five minutes in. Not, on even, the public not even on the episode. bonus episode. <laughs> yeah, no, that happened in Miami too when he was arraigned down in Miami. I thought it might have been kind of a... Uh, a zoo-like atmosphere, but, you know, a handful of people showed up. Um, and so, yeah, I'm hoping that the same is true for Fulton County, but it appears to be pretty quiet in New York. So the first half of the day today was spent on pre-jury stuff. Like, first of all, there was an outstanding motion for Justice Marchand to recuse from the case, and that was quickly denied. Um, then they made a couple of uh, decisions that they'd already made before, that the Access Hollywood tape is not allowed in, the audio is not allowed in, but the transcript is. And I know a lot of folks, you know, I see a lot of folks on uh, MSNBC talking about and CNN talking about how they're actually kind of surprised that the tape isn't uh, allowed in. It's a very strong piece of evidence, uh, but they are going to allow the transcript. So that's where we are with that. Karen McDougal's story is going to be allowed. She is also allowed to testify. Um, at first, there was some, I guess, reporting that perhaps that wasn't going to be allowed in, but it is now allowed in. And, and they, they decided that in some pretrial motions um, earlier, like uh, last week or the week before. So we'll get to hear Karen McDougal's story. Now, she is another person who she was um, part of that catch and kill uh, story with David Pecker and and his lawyer over at AMI, which is the owner of the Inquirer, National Inquirer. And um, that's going, so, you know, she basically had a year-long affair uh, with Donald Trump. And there's other uh, hush money payments here, too, that were meant to, in, to influence the election, including the doorman. Remember, they, they paid the doorman an exorbitant amount of money to keep his mouth shut. So all of that stuff can come in. Um, but one thing that cannot, another thing that can't come in along with the Access Hollywood tape is the deposition of Trump in the E. Jean Carroll case. Remember when he was asked if our stars really allowed to grab people by the genitals? And he was like, oh, yes, for millions of years. He actually said for millions of years, it's been, that's been the case, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> and then when asked if he was a star, he said yes. Uh, so that is not going to be allowed in unless, uh, I guess, a foundation is laid, but that that tape can't come in either. And Trump kind of treated that as and his team sort of treated those the, the Haxus Hollywood tape and the E. Jean Carroll deposition tape as sort of wins for them today. You wouldn't have guessed it by his little speech after, uh, you know, the first day was over. And we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. But they had to, you know, they took all the way up until lunch to get all that stuff decided. Uh, they were uh, Blanche Art was arguing again about some tweets not being allowed in because Trump has some kind of immunity for tweeting when he's president. Um, that was, you know, shut down pretty quickly. One, I think something interesting and important that happened is the prosecutors wanted Cohen's guilty plea for campaign finance violations to come in. So maybe to, to, to do something called drawing the sting, right, like to get it out in the open so they can show also so that they can show that Trump started going after him like the day after he pled guilty, kind of showing intent here to keep these things quiet. Right. 
Right. And it's totally not only did he start going after him after he pled guilty. Prior to that, he was nothing but compliments and praise for Michael Cohen. So it was like just a Friends in high pivot. places. And yeah. and so it it I think is one of those things that not only is it trying to like get out ahead of like the bad things they're gonna try and say about Cohen, which I don't think look, I mean Cohen Cohen lied, he was found guilty of that. I still think he will be a credible witness, but I think it's really the good news about this is while the judge said, hey, look, you're you're not likely to bring it in. But given that the defense is going to almost certainly try and undermine his credibility, you're going to be able to bring it up on cross. So I think it will be a very effective way to show. And it was just like, you know, it's like Trump has always done, whether it's with Cohen, whether it's with Flynn, whether it's whoever is in a position to potentially testify against him. He says nothing but nice things until people turn on him and then he pivots. And that's exactly what he did with Cohen. Uh, so. You know, and to me, the thing with this, and again, it was it was not surprising, and I don't know if disappointed is the right word, but I think it was Vaughn Hilliard on MSNBC. He was talking about trying to go back to the moment in time when the Billy Bush Access Hollywood tape was released and how everybody, including people in Trump's campaign, were like, oh my God, we're done. This is it. We are not going to recover from this. And that, you know, scrambling, he had to go talk to Melania. They were taping statements to, to be made. And to try and one Von Hilliard just like, oh, everybody's memory hold that because of the trauma. We don't think about it, which is unfortunate. But the other thing that's so important, and I know you know this and, and, and most of our listeners, because they were early adopters of listening to the Mueller She Wrote podcast, what is so important at that time is with that critical, that fatal thing, that tape that was going to kill his campaign, one of the primary things that saved him was the almost simultaneous or shortly hours later release of all these DNC, DCCC emails that had been hacked by the Russians that immediately took this, this spotlight off of Trump and this horrible campaign-ending tape and immediately was all of a sudden focused on her emails again and the things that were going mm -hmm. on with you know Podesta and everybody else in the Democratic Party, all hacked by the government of Russia. Mm -hmm. And the, the involvement, and people like, you know, everybody's eyes glaze over because to understand and remember the totality of 2016 and then 2017 is so hard. But I think what's important to remember is one, just how critical and horrible a moment this was for the Trump campaign and how devastating. And he was saved by this release of information that the government of Russia had stolen. And that the point you've made time and time again, all of this, this entire trial is not a result of the New York district attorney, although he's the one bringing the case, all of this is because of the work of special counsel, Robert Mueller. And that was the genesis of finding this information, of finding the payments, of digging into it, of subpoenaing records and getting that ultimately into state prosecutors. But I, we, if we ignore the genesis of this, if we ignore the role that Russia played in all of this, if we ignore the role that Robert Mueller played, we are missing the, you know, the forest for the trees, because that's absolutely, you cannot understand what is going on today in New York if you do not understand what was happening in 2016 with Donald Trump and Russia and hacked material stolen by a foreign nation saving his ass and allowing him to ultimately become president. Yeah. And then ultimately, uh, as far as this trial is concerned, the fact that the one-two punch of the Access Hollywood tape followed by a potential story that he had had an affair with an adult film star. Um, he was, you know, so we had the Access Hollywood tape come out. Then we had all the Podesta, D DNC, DCCC emails come out. Then you did not have the story of Stormy Daniels coming out because it was, or Karen McDougal, because it was caught and killed or because there were there was a hush money payment. By the way, is it too late for me still to buy a Bible from this man since this is all coming up? <laughs> I, I figured now's a good time to get, if I can get one of his Bibles and maybe have him sign it for me, that would be great. And, you know, make yeah. it out to Stormy and Karen or something. Right. With the Bill of Rights in there. Right. Yeah. So the, you know, the, the fact that this story didn't come out to counter what the Russians had done, um, we can speculate what that might have looked like, or if it would have been a campaign killer, but we'll never know. So that's what this trial is about. It's about election interference. That's what the jury was instructed today in the second half of the day, and we'll get to that shortly. Um, but a couple other things that they had to do before lunch was, um, first of all, Blanche told the court that Trump wants to be present for everything, 
including sidebars. Uh, and the judge said, well, that could be logistically problematic given Secret Service concerns. But later on, Blanche didn't want Trump to be present for everything, <laughs> uh, including his son's graduation and the, the Supreme Court thing. But we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and then what happened was uh, the judge recited something called the Parker warnings, right? Which means that Donald Trump must be present. And if he's not, he could have a warrant put out for his arrest. And of course, the right wing howler monkeys were like, they're threatening to arrest him. They do that with everybody. These are the it Parker was warnings. Stephonic, first and foremost, right? Leading the charge, yep. a proud congresswoman from New York. It's like, okay, great. So this is like literally a requirement for every criminal defendant <laughs> in the United States of America, but you're, you're fucking party It has leader. a name. It's called the Parker <laughs> warnings. Do you think they, like, <laughs> they just started just this today? Parker, Parker, some <laughs> triggered lib. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise it'd be called the Trump warnings. Um, but no, these are the Parker warnings. Uh, also, if he's disruptive, he could be asked to leave uh, and he would might forfeit his right to be at the trial. Um, and and probably the most important thing that happened, I mean, you know, a lot of the evidence stuff, uh, you know, that's all very important. But Maggie Haberman uh, noted that Donald Trump was nodding off and falling asleep. His jaw was slack. His mouth was open, catching flies. And, you know, that thing, remember in school where you would you you, you would nod off or I did this a lot when I was in the military uh, going to nuke school. You nod off a little bit. And then you realize you're falling asleep. It feels like you're falling. And so you jerk your head up. That apparently happened. So he was falling asleep. And then, of course, within minutes, Don Snorleone <laughs> and Sleepy Don uh, began trending together, number one in the country uh, for politics. So that was, I think, you know, uh, it's one of those made for TV moments, but it's also, I think, something very important going forward because it's going to be very hard for him now to to talk about sleepy Joe Biden because yeah, yeah. he's and falling asleep in the first half of his first day of court. And had it been Joe Biden, by God, that would be all anyone was talking about. And I, not obviously not just Fox and RSP or whatever would have the hell been, they are, but like yeah. everybody, CNN, even MSNBC, the nightly news, people would be talking about Joe Biden falls asleep. But Donald Trump somehow gets past. Now, Trump apparently heard and saw Maggie Hammerman because she put it on the New York Times feed because there's later reporting that after a break, he got up, like surveyed the press, looked at, uh, you know, Alvin Bragg or members of your team and then like gave her the stink eye for, you know, 20 seconds as he walked out of the room. So he absolutely knows what what's going on and what she had said. But he gets passed like he always does because it's so outrageous. It's so unbelievable that, well, we just can't wrap our heads around it. So let's just not consider it. But, mm -hmm. you know, Joe Biden, you know, has a, you know, misremembers a, you know, a specific you know, time period for his son's death. That's all we can talk about. You know, it gets put in the special counsel report about it. it just, it's mm -hmm. not equal. It boggles my mind, but you know, we'll see. It's a long trial. I guarantee you this will not be the first or last time you, <laughs> Don Snorleone. That's the gift that keeps on, you know, <laughs> and before that came from like, after that, he couldn't Don get the Porleone. bail. He was Don Porleone. <laughs> it's a, the gift that keeps on giving. So. Yeah. Well, and I mean, certainly, you know, Robert Herr, who pretended that the only reason he didn't bring charges against Joe Biden was because he was a sympathetic old man that would be falling asleep in the courtroom. Well, that didn't stop Alvin Bragg, because now we have an old man falling asleep in the courtroom. And uh, that's that's not why you don't bring charges. You don't bring charges because you don't have enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt and obtain and maintain a conviction. So here we are with this. Now, also, the DA, and I was waiting for this to come up, that the DA was going to bring up uh, right before lunch the uh, potential gag order violations. There's a limited gag order. Trump can't go after, you know, certain people, witnesses, et cetera. And he did that. He three in three different truth social posts, went after Stormy Daniels, went after Michael Cohen, um, and then also like called them sleaze bags. Uh, and then also claimed that he never had an affair with Stormy Daniels. And the DA asked for a show cause hearing, which means Donald Trump would have to show cause why they shouldn't hold him in contempt of court. And the DA is asking for a $3,000 fine, $1,000 for each of those posts. And that's where you start, right? You start with the small fines. You don't start with jail. I know that's upsetting, uh, <laughs> but 
you start with these fines. And uh, Merchan said he would deliberate during the lunch break, but he didn't um, make a ruling on that when he got back. He set a hearing. And I believe that hearing was initially set for April 24th, but now it's going to be April 23rd. Right. Um, but I thought the 22nd and 23rd, they were off court that day. But I, and I think they are for the jury stuff because of Passover, but they're going to have that hearing. Um, and, you know, Donald also has an April 22nd hearing for his bond, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and that's with regard to whether or not he facilitated Weisselberg's perjury and that, the, you know, there might be a small or or it might not even be about that. They might only be talking about whether or not this night insurance car loan guy can even be uh, the surety in this in this the, the guarantor in this bond. It's just a mess. Um, and then the judge reminded everyone, he was like, hey, you know what? 500 jurors are waiting. So let's go to lunch. Uh, and um, then that's when they took their first uh, lunch break uh, of the trial. And so they all filed out and um, came back after lunch, and we can talk a little bit about what happened when he gets back, but we do have to take a quick break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. We have more new patrons to thank. Don Delnocentis, Margaret Holger Trankier, sorry if I butchered that, Jane Miravasi, Marsha Beckwith, Truth Shout, Ups Jump the Jiggy with Plump Dump and Jiggy, Ruth <laughs> Zamoida, Will McKinley, Daniel Narbit. Thank all of you so much for helping support the program and being team members with us on this. Uh, you know, it is a ton of data out there in the media these days, and you allow us to sit down and talk to you each week and highlight the important stuff. So thank all of you for your support and making this possible. So let's go stay in New York. So the in the afternoon then, um, Judge Murchon addressed the DA's motion to show cause that Trump didn't violate his gag order. Now, he didn't make a determination from the bench. Uh, Murchon says he'd hold a hearing initially set on Wednesday, the 24th, and then updated that to Tuesday, the 23rd at 930. Now, that's still over a week from now, which gives Trump a lot of time as he you know, sits through and gets agitated to violate the gag order again and again and possibly again. And so then even given that during lunch, Trump walked right up to the line of the gag order and posted a video of his ally, Laura Loomer, the freak who went after me for apparently she heard being a Muslim uh, this weekend, but posted a video of her, including statements making references to Justice Murchon's wife and Michael Cohen. Uh, but before the judge brought in the prospective jurors, uh, Blanche again brought up the late discovery from the Southern District of New York, the feds up in New York, saying that they needed more time to review what he termed the overwhelming additional discovery. Uh, Murchon laid the hammer down saying, look, quote, you have 24 hours to hand over any relevant discovery to the DA or it's precluded from the proceeding. And then at that point, Trump got all animated and personally involved and pushed Blanche to, you know, fight back harder for more time. After that, Blanche asked when he will get the names of the jurors. And the judge reminded everyone that once they have the list, they can't photograph it, can't copy it in any way, and that afterwards they'll have to give the list back. Mm, yeah, and, and that makes sense, right? These are anonymized jurors um, per an order. He he anonymized the jury, so the names can't be released to the public. Trump gets the names, the, the both parties, the, the defense lawyers and the prosecution lawyers, get the list of names. Um, and they actually can uh, use those to look at people's social media in real time as the, as the jurors are coming up for voir dire. Um, so that's I think is interesting, and and they have time to do that because each juror has to sit there and orally answer all forty two questions in the jury questionnaire. So, but before the before the jurors came in, we're all waiting for the jurors to come in. But the parties discussed a Sandoval hearing, right? They have to determine the scope of Trump's testimony. If he testifies, that all has to be figured out before the trial begins. A Sandoval hearing is set for Tuesday morning. Now that's yesterday as you listen to this. We record this Monday afternoon. So that Sandoval hearing is going to be Tuesday morning at 930. Um, and like I said, since we record Mondays, we'll have to include the results of that in the next episode. Maybe we'll talk about it on the bonus for patrons this weekend. Um, and like you said, that's when uh, Judge Marchand changed the date of the gag order hearing to April 23rd. So then the 96 jurors 
the first batch of 96 made their way through security. And you had to go through security downstairs. Then you got to go up to the 15th floor. It's a separate bank of elevators. And then you got to go through another magnetometer to get into the courtroom. So they're filing in and the cameras are off in the overflow room. And and Judge Merchant tells the jury, uh, basically says the allegations are in substance that Donald Trump falsified business records to conceal an agreement with others to unlawfully influence the 2016 presidential election. And at this point, he's talking to all 96 of them, right? And he explained to the jury, you know, the, the same spiel that he's going to have to explain to each bank of 96 people, that y'all are the finders of fact, and that my role, the judge's role, is to ensure a fair and orderly trial in accordance with the law, and that both sides got a list of all the juror names uh, and the numbers. And again, like I said, they can look up their social media in real time. The judge then explains the burden of proof is on the prosecution, what reasonable doubt is. And Trump started to nod off again at this point. Um, His eyes were closed for quite a while. Uh, Then he read possible witnesses in this trial. Uh, And this was pretty fascinating. There was like more than 42 people on this list. And it's not that all of these people are going to be called to be witnesses, right? Some of them are just going to be mentioned during the course of the trial. And that is to, you know, basically let the jury know, hey, if you know any of these people, you know, you got to, you know, you got to let us know whether or not you can be fair and impartial here. And it includes, you know, Michael Cohen, of course, Stormy Daniels, Karen McDougal, David Pecker, Hope Hicks, um, Bradley Smith, who is an expert witness uh, for Trump, Rana Graff, Madeline Westerhout. She was the one who was like the gatekeeper of Donald Trump, right? She sat right outside the Oval Office. She was the one who brings in the checkbook for him to sign these <laughs> checks to Michael Cohen. Uh, Deborah Tarasoff and, and Jeffrey McConney, those are Trump accountants. Dylan Howard, he's the other guy over at AMI, the lawyer that who like, and remember the Southern District of New York gave them sort of an immunity, uh, limited immunity so that they could uh, help testify against Michael Cohen uh, in that case. So um, that's where Dylan Howard comes in. Weisselberg, Kellyanne Conway, Robert Costello, that's Bannon's lawyer. It's a lot. He's a lawyer to a lot of uh, really great people. Dan Scavino. Uh, Bannon himself, Rudy Giuliani, Don Jr., Ivanka, Kushner, Eric Trump. McEntee is on the list. Melania. Um, but again, that doesn't mean they'll all be called, but their names might be brought up at trial. So that was a, I thought that was pretty fascinating. Yeah. And some of those, like Rana Graff and Westerhout were the two gatekeepers, both before his uh, time in the Oval Office and during his time in the Oval, in the Oval Office. And so If you want to know the people who sort of like sat, like you were saying, the gatekeepers, the people who knew exactly what was coming and going. I mean, Cohen has some visibility because he was his fixer, but like the day in, day out person who's sitting out front are going to be Rona and and, and, uh, Westerhout. So it'll be interesting to me to see uh, what they testify to, if they do testify, what Hope Hicks does. Um, Because Hope Hicks is interesting because she's managed to get herself off the radar. I don't know what she's doing and other than her conversation or text or whatever it was essentially saying we're all effed uh, because of January 6th and we'll never get jobs again, which is the appropriate uh, sanction for working for a man who engaged in an insurrection. I'm curious mm-hmm. to see how and if she testifies and what how, how she frames the data uh, that she might have. Interesting. Keith Schiller, I didn't hear his name, but you know, you might recall that he was, I think, a retired NYPD uh, officer who for a long time was sort of like the Walt Nauta before Walt um, for Trump, yeah. but he he left. But I, you know, if if, if there was one person I would love to have uh, tell me everything, it would be Schiller. But I am certain that will never ever happen. But uh, interesting group, and uh, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know Kellyanne Conway is she going to testify? I don't know. I'd be curious. Yeah, no, I don't know either. But um, the. Interesting thing, I think probably one of the bigger stories out of jury selection today that we might need to carry forward in the days to come is that after all that, given all the instructions, given all the rules and stuff, he said, all right, raise your hand if you don't think you can be fair and impartial or if you have to if you have to can't be on this jury for other reasons. Almost two thirds left and he just dismissed them saying they can't be fair or impartial in this case. And that left what, like 36, 35, 46, 36, 46. 46 jurors left? 
Yeah, you know, and, and some more beyond that were like another nine were like go for other reasons. You know what, Alison, what bothers me about this is you have a group of people of his peers in New York City who – now, look, some people just don't want jury duty. This is a multi-month trial to have to sit there and, like, stop going to work and hope your work doesn't, uh, you know, Could retaliate also against you. Get, you sub- subject yourself to potential threats and scrutiny from, you know, the, the, un- the seemingly, you know, noxious parts of the MAGA world. If you are somebody in New York and you say, look, I am aware of the fact that this adjudged rapist, which the judge said by the commonly accepted term, you know, understanding of the definition of the word rape, he's a rapist. This man who is a fraudster found guilty for nearly half a billion dollars. This man who stands accused of lying, of conspiracy, of obstruction, of insurrection. If I sit there and say, you know what, I've heard about all that and I really, I I have opinions about this man which caused me some concern and i'm going to tell the truth and say all these horrible things about this person yeah that i'm aware of them who who does that leave you jury pool wise you're going to have a group of people who maybe don't pay any attention whatsoever to anything in our national political discourse which probably ain't the people i want on the jury or you got a ton of potential either neutral and or Trump supporters saying, oh, yeah, I can set my biases aside. I can I can be objective. That's not the jury pool that I want. I want some. And so I don't I don't know. I mean, you know, Merchan, there's I, I think he was very lenient in allowing people to, like, raise their hands to get out of things that maybe he shouldn't. But to the point at the end of the day that you need a unanimous jury to convict. The fact that you had. 50 out of 96 say, I can't be impartial. A huge chunk of them probably because they're looking at a rapist, a a defamer, a fraud. These are all settled, right? That's, those aren't allegations. Yeah, no, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't have minded seeing the judge ask a follow-up question. Why? Why, why can't you be impartial? Um, I think that that might've maybe gone a long way, but it also would have taken a lot of time uh, and I know they've got hundreds and hundreds of jurors to get through, but yeah, I thought that that was, mm, I, I, I would have liked to follow up. Let's just say that. Um, and then after they all left and the nine were let go for other reasons, uh, one by one, they bring them in 18 at a time because there's 18 seats in the jury box for 12 plus six alternates. And um, they would answer the 42 questions orally in the questionnaire. They went one by one. By the time they got to the third person, that person actually answered in the affirmative on question number 34, which is, you know, do you have any real strong feelings about <laughs> about Donald Trump? And uh, she said yes. Um, she was, uh, I believe she lived in um, in Harlem. She was originally born in Texas, not a native New Yorker. Uh, and she said she gets her news from Al Jazeera. And so she was dismissed. And then what happens is this, as soon as as soon as they're dismissed, um, one at a time, somebody comes in and fills their seat, right? And they just keep kind of doing that until the till they get through the rest of the day. I can't, and this just sticks in my craw. If you give a damn about American democracy, about this two hundred and what are we at seventy year plus experiment, how can you not? If you are even vaguely aware of anything going on in the world of Donald A. Trump, how can you not have a strong opinion about him? Now, I can see the answer being like, look, you may have strong opinions, but can you set that aside and just review the facts and apply them to the law? Great. I'm fine with that. But if you're striking people because they have strongly held opinions, if at this point in the United States of America, you do not have a strongly held opinion about Donald J. Trump. How? No, but Allison, how can you not? How can you look? I am I am fine with a rapist. I'm fine with somebody who called on China to help. I'm fine on somebody telling Vladimir Zelensky, just gin up some shit on Joe Biden and I'll give you some aid to protect yourself from the Russian invasion. How can you not have a strong opinion about that? There are people who don't know about that stuff. There are. And that's who the, that's who these, these folks want to have on, on the jury because they will have an easier time being fair and impartial. I I know Mm. where I'm steeped in it Mm. every day. It would be very difficult for me to not have a strong opinion. 
uh, I would be stricken from that jury immediately because I host podcasts that they probably will ask about. It, it, one more thing, Allison. If you don't have an, if you don't know, and fine, I got it. You know, we're both. I understand. Yeah, I live in D.C. I'm very much in this and have been in this for a long time. And yeah, I need to understand that there are people who just don't politics isn't their thing. If it isn't your thing, and you're having to answer those questions, and the person sitting twenty feet away from you away from you staring intently at you as you answer these very personal questions is both the former president of the United States of America and the presumptive Republican nominee for the president of America as you answer each one of these do do you think that has an impact on you as you're kind of thinking about all this i just i i don't i get it it's a it's a feature not a bug of our system it is the due process that i would want if i were in any sort of criminal proceeding, but I just don't know that I don't know that we end up with a representative jury of his peers, and that's just the Nate. You know, that's a that's a cost we got to pay, I guess, for for our system of justice. But it 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 sits uneasy with me. Yeah, well, yeah, that's it is the it is the system um, that we have. Um, now, after those first four. Uh, folks read that out that one uh, person was uh, dismissed. Um, then they had a, a Sutton Place resident um, and that, that listened to NPR's Up First. He answered yes to question 17, which is, have you or someone you know ever had an education training or work experience in the legal field? He's because he was a lawyer. He said yes. Um, then on to the next seat was an Upper West Side resident of 23 years, a bookseller for six years, married with two children. And he joked, he said his wife is a lawyer, general practice, antitrust. And another, he's also a podcast listener, whatever's on NPR when he's in his car. And he said, uh, in response to one question, he actually said, I feel that nobody is above the law, whether it's a sitting president, a former president, or a janitor. I like that guy. I want that guy in the jury. Yeah. Next up, another attorney from the Upper East Side. Um, this all the way, by the way, is coming, all this uh, detail is coming from Tyler McBrien at Lawfare. And the Upper East Side attorney is also a prosecutor for the Bronx County District Attorney's Office. And the judge said, you do this for a living. Can you assure us that you can be fair? And he said, yes. Uh, and on question 16, he said, my girlfriend is a finance. Um, she works in finance for a bank and said, but I honestly don't know what she does. And that got a laugh uh, from the press in the press room. And then the next person was an Upper East Side resident, originally from Chicago. She works in social media marketing. She watches sports, reality TV, gets her news from social media platforms and the Wall Street Journal, and that her dads and brothers and boyfriend all work in finance. So that's pretty much ever. There was somebody from FanDuel. Somebody worked at, at FanDuel that was there. And they just went through, answered these questions or these questionnaires. They got through about nine or 10 people. And uh, Judge Marchand was very, very adamant about stopping at 4.30. He stopped at 4.28, let everybody file out of the courtroom, and they're going to reconvene Tuesday, which is yesterday as you listen to this, tomorrow as we record it, again at 9.30. We're going to have that Sandoval hearing probably before they let the jurors in tomorrow to continue with the voir dire. But that was that was the day. And I, I think the news of the day was that Trump was falling asleep, couldn't stay awake. Uh, and I think that the fact that 50 people couldn't be impartial and got let go uh, is probably uh, the big story as far as jury selection is concerned. Yeah. And I think we'll get, I mean, keep in mind that they brought in what, 600, 500 jurors. So, you know, they bring them in and they rotate them through. And so they will seat a jury. I just, uh, again, it is interesting to me the the level of detail that or, or or the standard that they were allowing people to you know kind of voluntarily say nope I don't want to do it uh, and get out of it and so we'll see I you know there's some you know favorite parlor game on TV and you know talk in DC is like how long is jury selection going to take is it going to be two weeks is it going to be longer I hope it doesn't take more than two weeks I mean we'll see based on today well, if we've got through- on the holidays just the holidays alone for the rest of April, there's only about six or seven trial days, um, jury selection days left in the month of April. So this could go into uh, the first week of May easily. Uh, But we'll see. We'll see what ends up happening, what kind of jury they'll get. I, of course, am terrified that they'll have some sort of a mole that will uh, get in uh, and hang the jury. Uh, That's my concern. I think that's probably everybody's concern. Um, It can't be 
extremely easy to to pick those people out, you know, looking at just at their social media or having them answer these questions. But because, you know, somebody said, I can't remember who it was, but somebody said if their answers are too good, you also might want to strike that person. Like, well, I can be fair and impartial, you know, like, it, <laughs> oh, reading, really? Reading off the little yeah, sheet that they were hand. Yeah. Off your yeah hand. And, and, and the other, <laughs> one last thing that after the, uh, after the jury left, everybody thought they were done. And then there was one last thing. And, uh, Trump's attorney team said, hey, look, your honor, this is really unfair. His Supreme Court argument is on the 25th. He really should be allowed to do it. And Merchant's like, well, Judge Merchant, yeah, you know, a Supreme Court case is important, but your client is a criminal defendant in New York. He's required to be here. He is not required to be in the Supreme Court. I will see him here next week. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the way, he didn't bar Trump from going to Barron's graduation. Um, which is something else Donald Trump complained about on his on the courthouse steps afterwards. He just said, "We'll we'll see when it comes up, um, where we're at." Uh, but um, you know, I think Barron isn't that who Melania was pregnant with when Trump cheated with Stormy Daniels. I mean, yes, it's a very yes, odd indeed. Yeah, or or that, yes. I think somebody tweeted like, "Man, if you cared about his birth as much as you care about his graduation, we might not even be here." <sighs> <laughs> so. yeah, if, if assuming you remember his name because you just talk about my son without mm. like again the no and then no eric was like can name. you believe they won't let his go to his son's graduation like i know that he did not go to eric's he couldn't he probably <laughs> didn't go to eric's graduation and that's why eric was like but what he didn't have a criminal trial excuse back when <laughs> eric, eric, graduated. eric choking down the bitterness to feign outrage oh man all right. We actually have a lot more news to get to uh, this week besides the trial, the 2016 election interference trial. But we do have to take another quick break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We have more patrons to thank, including L. Ross, Gina B., Aaron Karen, Blake Smith, M. Asbury, Stephen Kramer, Helen Hort, Lori Fleming, Chris Pallas, and Lemon Test. Love it. Thank you very much. Um, and let's actually, we'll stay in New York, but we'll, we'll leave the 2016 election interference fraud trial. We'll talk about the New York Attorney General civil fraud case instead, because Tish James has doubled down on her request for the court to order the fiscal monitor, Barbara Jones, to investigate whether Trump and Weisselberg facilitated perjury in a letter she addressed a note that Trump sent to the court. She says, on behalf of the office attorney general, we write to very briefly respond to the letter submitted last night by the defendants. Spanning more than 10 single spaced pages, the defendant's argument boils down to the proposition that the court is powerless to determine if fraud was committed upon it during the course of two separate proceedings because discovery is closed. That is manifestly not the case. The court has inherent authority over any actions that would undermine the integrity of its proceedings. She goes on to say, Mr. Weisselberg has admitted that he perjured himself during discovery in the trial in this action. The court is well within its authority to determine if defendants and their counsel facilitated that perjury by withholding incriminating documents. Of course, these are the emails between the Forbes reporter and Weisselberg about the size of the triplex apartment. And, you know, we talked about this uh, last week. New York Attorney General went through all the discovery and didn't see those emails, uh, but got them from the Forbes guy. So she wants Barbara Jones to take a look to see whether or not they knew they had those emails, why they didn't transmit them, if they didn't transmit them during discovery. And were Donald Trump and his lawyers facilitating Weisselberg's perjury by withholding those documents? She goes on to say the monitor has already been tasked with uh, assessing the defendant's internal controls, compliance functions, and record keeping. The potential failure to properly produce documents in a legal proceeding relevant to the valuation of Trump's triplex plainly falls within the ambit of her authority and certainly within the power of this court to safeguard the integrity of its own proceedings. And even if the defendant's myriad complaints had merit, as to the court's ability to modify the monitor's duties or advance an inquiry after trial, the investigative matter remains open and the court has the authority to appoint a special referee to conduct the inquiry. So again, the discussion 
uh, on the bond. The hearing that they're going to have is going to be April 22nd. That's a day before his uh, April 23rd hearing back <laughs> back for the election interference trial, which is a few days before the April 25th Supreme Court oral arguments that are going to take place on his immunity issue. Um, and so he's got a pretty packed schedule here, but it's going to be very interesting to see what comes up in that April 22nd hearing, because is it going to be this facilitating perjury situation? Is it going to be the fact that uh, Mr. Hankey and his night insurance company <laughs> doesn't have the money to cover the bond and contracted with Trump that he wouldn't cover the bond if Trump lost, which is the whole point of having a guarantor um, cover your bond. So, uh, or it could be both of those situations. Uh, but we'll be we'll be tuning in on April twenty second for sure. Yeah, and I'm I, I sure do hope that they get into the bond issue because I mean we talked about on the bonus episode about the uh, you know the subprime car loan king Don Hankey who. <laughs> Gave put up apparently money that he didn't have for a guarantee that he actually wasn't making. And the amazing thing is, Hanky, like so many people in the Trump orbit, gives interviews where they say the quiet part out loud. And this is a quote from Hanky: "We thought it would be an easy procedure that wouldn't involve other legal problems, and it's not turning out that way. We probably didn't charge enough," Hanky said in an interview. And then he continued: hmm. "We've been getting a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls. Maybe that's part of the reason he had trouble." with other insurance companies. <laughs> and that's from Reuters reporting, which is great. But yes, yes, that is probably exactly why he had problems with other companies, uh, particularly those who are actually licensed in the state of New York to do these sorts of things. And maybe mm. when you run into people where you have to like just not give an interview to somebody, but actually have to produce facts contained in documents in a court of law under penalty of perjury, Maybe that changes things a little bit. So I wouldn't be surprised if Trump rolls out of this hearing without any sort of bond guarantee and is back on the hook to having Eric and Don Jr. scrambling to, you know, call everybody in princes and prime ministers to see if somebody will pony up, you know, the guarantee for the uh, hundred plus million dollars that he's on the hook for. Hmm. Well, well, we'll see. We'll know soon. It's uh, next week. So lots of stuff going down next week. It's going to be a busy week. Yeah. Busy week for our good friend, Rudy. Uh, Rudy, yeah. And this is like, we're going to pivot from New York and let's take a, uh, you know, two hour cell ride down, three hour cell ride down to Washington, D.C., where Judge Beryl Howell has denied Rudy Giuliani's bid to reverse the $148 million verdict in the Rudy Freeman and Shea Moss defamation case. Uh, she wrote in uh, this uh released today, quote, Giuliani's renewed motion urging this court to reverse its prior findings and rulings and to override the jury's considered verdict on the basis of five threadbare arguments falls well short of persuading that, quote, the evidence and all reasonable inferences that can be drawn therefrom are so one-sided that reasonable men and women could not have reached a verdict in plaintiff's favor. Continuing the jury's verdict, awarding plaintiffs compensatory and punitive damages for defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress caused by Giuliani and his co-conspirators, as reflected in the final judgment in the amount of $145,969,000 plus post-judgment interest, stands. So sorry, Rudy. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's funny that that Rudy's argument was like, but you have to overturn it because the evidence was so overwhelming that no one would have been able to not find me guilty. Like that, what? Thre That's threadbare, your... threadbare, threadbare okay. arguments. Okay. <laughs> Judge Howell's words: five threadbare arguments falling well short of the standard. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine just sent me a, a video on Twitter. Apparently, Rudy Giuliani just posted a video of himself at Sheridan Church in Tulsa this past Sunday. Continuing to claim Ruby Freeman fraudulently handled ballots in the 2020 election. So he continues to defame. Rudy's going to be standing with a hat in his hand next to a cot at that Tulsa church where he's sleeping because he has no money left uh, to fund his uh, legal defense all his before apartments. he heads to jail in Fulton County somewhere. But go for it, Rudy. Yeah. Fulton County. Or, you know, yeah, Tulsa. Tulsa, I guess, is like, watch your wallet because Rudy's in town. Yeah. Well, yeah. Watch out for the bumper. All right, we have more news to get to, but we have to take one more quick break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey. 
Hey, welcome back. Our last batch of new patrons to thank includes Otto Neal, Becky McColland, Martin Greaves, Jane Johnson, JB, Debbie Lee, Trump for Prison 2024, Lisa Walden, Annie Bach, and long story short, long past time I started paying. <laughs> thank you. Thank all of you so much for your patronage, for allowing us to put this together. You are just uh, amazing uh, supporters and can't thank you enough. And with that, uh, we move from D.C. down to Georgia for a quick update. So Judge McAfee denied Kathy Latham's request to strike Act 160 from the Fulton County RICO indictment. Act 160 accuses Latham of committing perjury in furtherance of alleged RICO conspiracy to overturn the election. This is, quote, Defendant Latham challenges Act 160 contained within count one of the indictment, presumably by way of General Demur, arguing that her alleged conduct amounting to perjury under Georgia law is, quote unquote, barred by federal law. A General Demur challenges the substance of an indictment by asserting its legal invalidity, more specifically that the indictment fails to allege a crime. The defendant's argument rests on the idea that, the o- that only the federal government can punish someone for perjury committed in federal court. This means, according to the defendant, that <laughs> because so her dumb. alleged... Uh, <laughs> right, only the best people, Allison. This means, according to the defendant, that because her allegedly false statements were made in conjunction with a federal proceeding, the state cannot punish her for perjury in violation of Georgia law. Oh. The court finds, however, that the defendant's sole citation is inapplicable because the state has not substantively charged the defendant with perjury. Nor has the defendant provided any authority subjecting overt acts to the pleading standards of a demur. Now, to understand this a little bit, you need to understand what an overt act is versus a charge. The charge might be, think of it something like a bank robbery. Bank robbery is a crime, right? It's a federal crime. There are all kinds of state local crimes against it. But that crime of bank robbery, to do that, there are things called overt acts that you conduct in pursuit of that crime. So you might like... I went and got a car. I went and got a gun. I put a mask on my head. I wrote a note to the teller. I walked into the bank. All of those individual things, it's not a crime to get a gun necessarily. It's not a crime to put on a mask. It's not a crime to write a note. But those are overt acts that you take in pursuance of the crime. So that's what, you know, the the argument is that that's the difference between, uh, you know, an overt act versus an actual charge. And this, you know, when we get down to it, this is Act 160. (laughs) So on or about the first day of September 2022, Kathleen Alston Latham committed a felony offense of perjury in violation of Georgia Law 16-1070A in Houston County, Georgia, by knowingly, willfully, and unlawfully making at least one of the following false statements in deposition in the matter of Curling v. Raffensperger in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia judicial proceeding after having been administered a lawful oath. One, that she was only present at the Coffee County Board of Elections Registration Office in Coffee County, Georgia, for, quote, just a few minutes, unquote, on January 7th, 2021. Two, that she only, quote, walked into the front part, unquote, of the Coffee County Board of Elections <laughs> Registration on January 7th, 2021, and, quote, didn't go into the office, unquote, that she had, quote, no idea, unquote, if employees of the Sullivan Stricker met Eric Cheney at the Coffee County Board of Elections Registration Office on January 7, 2021. Three, that she did not see Misty Hampton at the Coffee County Board of Elections Registration Office on January 7, 2021. Four, that her only interaction with Scott Hall at the Coffee County Board of Elections Registration Office on January 7, 2021 was meeting him, speaking to him outside of the office, and then leaving the office. And five, that she did not see Scott Hall speak to anyone other than herself at the Coffee County Board of Elections Registration Office on January 7, 2021. So again, use that bank robber analogy. The the crime, the broad crime is the, 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 the perjury offense, right? And then all of these little underlining overt acts. And I love it. I was just in the front part. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the thing here is that whole act, all of that, all of that perjury is an overt act. It's not they she would she was like, you have to dismiss 160 because only the feds can charge me with perjury. And Judge McAfee's like, nobody charged you with perjury. Next. So uh, this is an overt act. It's an underlying part of the racketeering charge. Count one. She wants to dismiss racketeering because one of the overt acts is perjury. 
Uh, it's not a charge of perjury. And I, I guess he just had to explain that to her. I, I, I thought that's why I was laughing at the up, up top there is because what? Um, you weren't charged with perjury. You were charged with racketeering. Um, so that I thought was pretty funny. Also, remember uh, one of the fraudulent electors, Burt Jones, who's now the lieutenant governor? Hmm. I do. D.A. Fonnie Willis was recused from investigating him for a conflict of interest, an actual conflict of interest, because she had gone to or set up a fundraiser for his opponent for lieutenant governor. And at the time, back in the day, when he when he was doing the fraudulent elector stuff, he was a state senator. And so she couldn't um, prosecute. The D.A.'s office was removed from prosecuting Burt Jones because of that conflict of interest. And that was removed by Judge McBurney early on before McAfee got the case. And then what happened was it goes over to this guy named Pete Scandalakis. He's a state prosecutor. And they say, all right, you find somebody, Pete, not you, Pete, but Pete Scandalakis, to prosecute Burt Jones. Pete Pete Scandalakis is like, okay, we'll do. 21 months later, they still don't have a prosecutor for Burt Jones. So Scandalakis appoints himself. To, to, to yeah. investigate Burt Jones. Yeah. The, the best part I saw on this is, and just looking this up now, that Jones immediately issued a statement, quote, I'm happy to see this process move forward and look forward to the opportunity to get the charade behind me. Fonnie Willis made a mockery of this legal process as she tends to do. I look forward to a quick resolution and moving forward with the business of the state of Georgia. So mm. I, you know, I don't know Scandalakis. I, I do know that that's a mighty, mighty long time to wait. 21 months, three months short of two years. But, uh, you know, tapping yourself and say, yeah, I'll take it. Well, we'll, we'll see how Why that goes. Why didn't you take it 21 months ago? I, Bro, I, 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 what we don't yeah. know is how many people he tried to reach out to or, you know, how many people he asked and looked into what we have no idea the body of work he put into this, whether he did anything or nothing and then just decided, oh, we're getting long in the tooth. I'll take it myself. We really I we have no idea uh, about how that went down. I'll keep following um, really great reporters like Anna Bauer and folks over Atlanta Journal Constitution to keep an eye on that to see if they get any more information about what took so long and what steps he took to try to find a prosecutor, um, Scandalakis, that is, before he just gave it to himself. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that and, uh, um, we'll, you know, let you know as, as, as that unfolds. But anyway, that's, that's what's going on down in, in Fulton County these days. Yeah. And let's, let's finish up by going back to Washington, D.C., where the Senate Judiciary Committee finally appears to be doing something. This is from CNN. Senate Democrats on Thursday issued a subpoena to a conservative legal advocate they're investigating in response to a series of ethics controversies at the Supreme Court involving lavish travel and gifts to justices. Months after voting to authorize the subpoena, the Senate Judiciary Committee formally issued one to Leonard Leo. Committee Chairman Dick Durbin said, Democrats say the subpoena is necessary to better understand whether specific individuals and groups have used undisclosed gifts to gain access to the justices. This is a Durbin quote. Mr. Leo has played a central role in the ethics crisis plaguing the Supreme Court, and unlike the other recipients of information requests in this matter, he has done nothing but stonewall the committee. Durbin statement CNN and continues, the subpoena is a direct result of Mr. Leo's own actions and choices. Now, uh, Leonard Leo's attorney, David Rivkin, sent a letter back to Durbin asserting that he is, quote, not complying with what he termed the unlawful and politically motivated subpoena. <laughs> now, the committee voted along party lines in November to authorize subpoenas for Leo and GOP megadonor Harlan Crow, the owner of the uh, luxury yacht where Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas took what any one of us could easily take after flying on a private jet to get to Southeast Asia and, you know, hop on a yacht, a mega yacht to sail around Southeast Asia just, or the Mediterranean the a few people, years Pete. before. Let him have just his, every, everyday people, know. everyday people, just salt of the earth. I, 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 I Clarence Thomas in his RV stopping in the Walmart parking lot because he's a man of the people and that's where he likes to hang out when he's not on a Harlan Crow owned mega yacht cruising around in the Indonesia somewhere. But so those, they authorized subpoenas for both Leo and Harlan Crow in response to revelations of the travel accepted 
by several Supreme Court justices, not just Clarence Thomas, but also Samuel Alito. <laughs> now, surprisingly enough, you'll be surprised to hear that these lavish trips that Crow gave to Thomas initially went unreported on Thomas's financial disclosure reports, according to a series of reports in ProPublica. Leo arranged for a 2008 fishing trip attended by Alito, according to a ProPublica report. Similarly, we shocked to hear, Alito did not report this trip on his financial forms. Now, it's not clear why Durbin, who's an Illinois Democrat, waited months between the vote to authorize the subpoenas and actually going ahead and issuing one. Committee vote last fall broke down in partisan rancors. Republicans accused Democrats of playing politics and walked out of the hearing. <laughs> if Leo ultimately does not comply, Democrats could be forced to hold a vote and find 60 votes in the split chamber to enforce it. Now, again, I'm curious what you think. I mean, this all brings the, up the question about like, why now? Why wait that long? Why wait until April? You know, my sense is twofold. I don't think they have 60 votes. I don't think they'll nah. get there with enough Republicans. And the other thing, I think you wait because it will take a few months to fight through this process. And that means you're, we are going to all be talking about it. The press is going to be talking about it. This fight is going to be going on in April and May and June and July of the election year. So I hope... I'm extending a, you know, like bit of like strategic forethought to Dick Durbin that, well, if we can't get this 60 vote threshold we need, let's at least put the debate in the middle of election season. So I, I don't know what you think. Yeah, I don't know either. I do know that the attorney general in D.C., not the U.S. attorney, but the, the attorney general named Schwab is criminally investigating Leonard Leo's network of nonprofits and whether he was personally enriching himself from the donations that he got to his network of dark money nonprofits. So, and, and he's gotten a lot of blowback on that. He's gotten Republican state attorneys general trying to throw their, you know, muck up the works. He's got Jim Jordan and Comer and the house Republicans trying to, you know, demand all this stuff and subpoena his office for all sorts of things. Uh, as as he tries to investigate this uh, criminally. So we'll see where, where that ends up as well. But again, like you said, the nexus of all this might be right at election time uh, in a post, the first post row election uh, in, a, in a year or two when everybody is questioning the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. So I don't know if it's political. I don't know if it's not. Uh, but it's nice at least to see these subpoenas go out. But you're right. I don't think they have the votes. We'll keep an eye on it, though. All right. I think we got through all the news uh, for the, for the <laughs> Shockingly week. Shockingly enough, it won't last. <laughs> no. And we'll, and we'll be keeping an eye on um, on what goes on, obviously, during jury selection over the next week, two, three weeks, who, however long it takes. And uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, we'll definitely go over it in detail on next week's public episode. We might talk a little bit about it on our bonus episode for patrons this weekend. Uh, and also depending on what else, what other news drops this week, it's not going to slow down at all. The news hasn't slowed down at all since, uh, since everybody came back from the new year. So I don't imagine we will have uh, a dearth of things to talk about. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you, uh, you know, if you're a patron and you support us at the $2 level, you get that bonus episode, you get a whole extra episode every week. So thank you again to our patrons. Thanks to everybody for listening. Um, it's not, you know, the patrons, seriously, you, you really do help us out a lot. But everybody who listens to this show, just listening, really makes a difference. And, and we really do appreciate it. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Do you have any final thoughts before we get out of here on day one of the Trump? Yeah, we're, I mean, look, we're running. I, it, whether you are in taking PT tests in the Army, taking PT tests in the Bureau, running a race, you prep and you prep and you prep and everything that goes into it, all the anticipation, all the nerves, getting there to the day with the, you know, the starting gun goes off and you're running, we're running trials underway. Right. And I cannot wait to uh, meet so many patrons uh, this Saturday. Thank mm -hmm. you for your support. Really looking forward to that, but the race is underway. We're, we're running. And so all of that prep, all the waiting, all the what ifs, what's going to happen. We're going up in New York. So in, yeah, who'd in have thought ways, months ago, months ago, when we scheduled this, uh, MSW meetup for dinner, cocktails and mocktails this Saturday, we would be right in between the first week of the criminal first criminal trial of the former president. And right before the hearing on the 22nd hearing on the 23rd, we got another oral arguments at the Supreme Court on the 25th. I mean, I couldn't I, I could never imagine 
that we would be right in the middle of, of the beginning of this race. So thank you very much. I look forward to seeing everybody on Saturday. And Pete, thank you um, for for joining me on this podcast. I, I'm so, so thankful that that you're you're my co-pilot. Yeah, it's been great. And again, it's not a it's not a sprint. <laughs> we, we got we got no. at least twenty six miles in front of us, if not more. So it will uh, be frustrating. It's, a, it's, it's not a marathon. It's going to be like some Iron Man from hell. But we we've got a long way to go. But at least we're running. So that's a. I always felt like once <laughs> once you're moving, it may suck, it may be painful, but at least you're moving. So let's go, let's go. Thank you. Can't think wait to meet you all in, in a few days. Think smoky. <laughs> I think he's bounding down. Right. You got to There's. There's got a, got a long way to go and a short time to get there. <laughs> there's a party in Atlanta and there's beer in Texarkana yeah. and it's, it's, it's a long way to go. Uh, so we'll talk to you next week. We'll see patrons this weekend. Thanks very much. I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Strzok. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. <laughs>